So thank you all for being here. I know it's uh, Halloween, so we are for a treat without a trick. <laughs> from uh, Professor Hector Valdivia, who is sitting right here. And uh, Hector, just to read his title, because I can't remember his long title. So, uh, Hector Valdivia, MD, PhD, Frank N. Wilson, Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine and Professor of Internal Medicine, Professor of Molecular and Integrative Physiology, Co-Director, Center for Arrhythmia Research at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor place that has the largest football stadium anywhere in the world. And um, Hector and I met for the first time many years ago, as I realized, in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, when he was still there. And then uh, 20 years ago, he started to move to Ann Arbor, Michigan. It's so a long time. Not at all. Mm -hmm. I, I stayed 20 years in Madison, uh, and only, 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 only six, four years ago, I moved to all right, so uh, Hector received his uh, MD from uh, the University, National University of Mexico in Mexico City, and then started his PhD there, but moved to Texas, and got his PhD from Baylor. And since then, as you heard, he was in Madison, Wisconsin, and now at uh, University of Michigan. And he's been really doing beautiful, elegant work on calcium cycling in cardiac cells, uh, a work that I've been following over the years. And the interesting thing, in addition to the basic science interest of what he does, is its relationship to cardiac arrhythmias, uh, in particular CPDT, which has been a recent interest in my laboratory also. So feeding the, feeding the Halloween thing, we'll hear all about scorpion and snakes. So. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's been a pleasure to be here. I'm really impressed with what you, general, the people, the facilities. Everything is wonderful. Um, and and today I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about something I, I hope uh, is of interest to, to this type of, to this group. Um, it's about uh, arrhythmias. So um, and it's about um, it, it has to do with scorpions, snakes, insect insecticides, and coffee for reasons that I'm going to make uh, apparent when I talk about each of those things uh, as, as, as they come in order. Uh, so um, the, the, the central subject will be a, an intracellular channel, the Ryanodin receptor, calcium release channels from the sarcoplasm in particular. And, and, and since I'm going to be talking arrhythmias, uh, I have to explain how an intracellular channel produces arrhythmias or generates arrhythmias. Uh, and, and the link is being already worked out. And so I'm just gonna give you a brief introduction as to where our act actors are and what they do. So this is a uh, big heart, and I uh, just, just to tell you that without the Ryan receptor, the heart does not beat. And uh, that's essentially the, the, the message of, the, of, the, of this uh, slide. But uh, so, so a wave of calcium accompanies uh, each, each contraction. Of course, th this one is, is very slow. Uh, it actually happens in a synchronized way. way. Um, and um, we have already worked out um, through the years the organelles that are, let me go here so that I don't block. Yeah. Um, the organelles that participate in excitation contraction coupling. And, and if we take a, a, this for micro or this uh, a presentation of the main organelles, we have the wave of the polarization uh, that uh, occurs at the sarcolemma, the external membrane, and then there's, there's invaginations of those of that external membrane uh, into the interior of the cell, which are called the, the transverse tubules. So uh, when the transverse tubules depolarize, then that is the signal for calcium release from this intracellular organelle, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is full calcium, it's about one millimolar free calcium uh, in, inside that organelle. So there's huge gradient for calcium to get out of it. A and then when calcium gets out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, then it, it bathes the myofilaments containing the uh, contracted proteins and that induces the contraction. Now, uh, at the uh, electron microscope level, um, 
we would see something like this uh, for uh, for um, um, the place where excitation contraction coupling takes place. Uh, so this is supposed to be a T tubule, and uh, no, it's not supposed to be. It, it is a, a T tubule cut in a in a cross sectional way, and this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and look how close it gets to the T tubule at that at these special junctions uh, in the uh, skeletal muscles. They are called triads because there's one sarcoplasmic reticulum, two sarcoplasmic reticulums, and one T tubule in the heart. Most of this. Most of these junctions are diets because there's only one sarcoplanet, uh, one uh, sarcoplanet reticulum with one t -tubule. So, and, and these arrows point to electron-dense particles that are visible with the electron micrograph uh, and, and with the electron microscope. And those are rayanolin receptors. They are so huge that they, they, they are one of the few proteins that can be visualized individually uh, um, through electron microscopy. These are... Um, um, microscopic um, molecules, uh, <coughs> 2 million daltons, the tetramer. Um, so it's a huge protein. And you know, on top of that, there's also a lot of accessory proteins that adorn and modulate the activity of the channel. It's been recently uh, solved in terms of the structure uh, by cryo-electron microscopy, not by crystallography. Uh, about 80% of the amino acids have been already mapped in terms of where, where they participate in, in the structure of cryo-electron So. That's, that's where uh, the brain is located. In terms of how it works, it's been, it's been worked out for, for many years now of how the calcium cycles in the myocyte. We have a small entry of calcium through L-type calcium channels, and this ent small entry of calcium is not sufficient to induce contraction. It has to be amplified by the rayanolin receptors. And here the thickness of the arrows uh, is meant to, to, to tell you the, uh, the the contribution of L-type calcium channels in relation to the receptor. The amplification is about four or five times, depending on the species. Uh, and so the, the calcium that exits the Rayanolin receptor uh, from the sarcoplasmic reticulum is mostly responsible for the, for the contraction of the myofilaments. And it's trapped back into the SR by the calcium pump, uh, controlled by phospholamban. And the calcium that entered uh, has to be extruded from the cell, and that's where the sodium calcium is changing. So that's, that's in a very rough way, a uh, very simple way, the calcium cycling in the sarcoplasmic and in the, in the ventricular myocyte. Most of the extrusion is done by the sodium calcium exchange, although there's participation of calcium farms. Okay, so that's, now, as Isaac Asimov put it, um, life is pleasant, death is peaceful, is the transition what's troublesome. And, and in terms of ventricular myocyte, what's, transi what's was the transition where that is troublesome is to go, to go from basal resting conditions to a beta adrenergic state. And so what, what, are the, what are the conditions here? So beta adrenergic stimulation increases cardiac performance. And so this is the type of, uh, of, of recording that I'm going to be showing, in which we have a ventricular cell. Uh, and then we put a, a line scan that, uh, that scans uh, the fluorescence of, of, this, uh, of this cell. It's, 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 it's loaded with an intracellular calcium indicator. And then we do field stimulation, one per second, for instance. And then, then we record the transients that are occurring. This is time, and this is the length of the cell, and, and, and this is the profile that is, uh, uh, that is done uh, by plotting the intensity of this signal here. So uh, as you can see here, uh, 100 nanomolar isoportorian uh, olisare, beta adrenergic agonist. And look at the look at the uh, at the amplitude of the calcium transient. And if you are to expand also this transient, you see that it is sharper here than it is here. So it, it's it's of higher amplitude and shorter duration. So it's it's a more it's a more sharp, uh, more uh, intense signal. And and that of course translates into higher into a stronger contraction. And the mechanism by which that but but that happens is how it worked out. Better than electrical stimulation stimulates uh, uh, production of PKA. This targets several proteins. One of them is the calcium channel. It increases calcium entry into the ventricular myocyte. And it also uh, it stimulates calcium release. And perhaps more importantly, it stimulates calcium uptake, which loads the SR of calcium. So there's, there's extra calcium in the SR, and that also stimulates higher calcium release. So the, the whole cycle uh, gets accelerated here. And, and, 
and also uh, through the stimulation of gun kinase 2, now we have activation of this enzyme, which targets the same proteins but at different sites and prepares those proteins for higher calcium cycling. Uh, that's that's the, the main message that uh, he's trying to convey here. Um, but then also, the, because there's more calcium entry, there's gotta be more calcium exit, and is through this happens through an electrogenic transporter. The sodium calcium exchanger, right there. So the sodium calcium exchanger uh, gets one calcium out and three sodium in for each cycle that it, in which a calcium is exchanged. So that is, that is an electrogenic uh, transporter. It, 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 it tends to depolarize the cell uh, by, by, by extruding calcium. And it is in this process where if we have a spontaneous calcium release in the middle of diastole, then calcium that is being released has to be, uh, is, tends to be extruded by the sodium calcium exchanger through creating what is called a delayed active depolarization. And if this has an, the threshold high enough to activate certain channels, then it triggers activity, it, it triggers an extra action potential. And that is how, that is how Ryanovic receptors can generate arrhythmias. That's the way it communicates with the external membrane through the sodium calcium exchange of mainly. <coughs> All right, so, so by isoprotenol, it stimulates, incre increases cardiac performance, but also arrhythmia vulnerability, right, because of this communication that it had with the sodium calcium exchange. Here, uh, I show you a, a, an example of uh, how Ryan receptors actually get into the arrhythmia business um, by, by, uh, by doing uh, extracellular calcium, I mean, spontaneous calcium release. So this is, this understanding this slide is, is critical for understanding the concept that I'm gonna advance. So I'm gonna stop here and, 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 and uh, itemize what is going on here. So first let me, let me go with the normal process. There you, got, you, you have um, a cell that is being paced at one hertz and we have a, a patch electrode that is recording uh, memory, uh, uh, um, memory potential, and also we have um, a calcium indicator that is telling us what's the calcium cycling in response to that stimulation. So we have an action potential and a calcium transient. Normal, 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 normal. Each time we stimulate, we have an action potential and a calcium transient. So that's that's okay. That's not that's normal. That's what I'm say. But then here, here with no stimulation, right here at this point. The cell is started to throw cal to 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 induce a spontaneous calcium release. It is started right here because remember this is time. Started right here and then propagate to the center of the cell, and then suddenly it gets a, a synchronous calcium release along the axis of the cell, and that is so that is so coordinated that it produces uh, and first you can see the little bump here in the action pot in the memory potential. That's a delayed active depolarization that then an action potential is, is triggered at that point. So this is an example in which a spontaneous calcium release causes an arrhythmic event. But now, look how most of the other spontaneous calcium releases don't cause, don't do any, any noise or a little noise only in the membrane potential. Let's look at this, this uh, spontaneous calcium release. It starts right there, one edge of the cell, slowly propagates to the other edge of the cell, and it only creates a little bump in the membrane potential, but it doesn't induce an action potential, right? So, so this one is silent, let's call it. It's a silent calcium release. And, and so goes for the other. They look very prominent in the calcium profile. They look this aberration, so calcium release. But then you look at the membrane potential, there's nothing, there's no noise there just a little bump in the, in the memory potential. So, and, and it happens most of the times. Most of the times, you look, at the, the action potentials are normal, or even though there's a lot of alterations here in the calcium transients. Even though, right here we stop the stimulation, and only this one is, is sufficient to produce an action potential, and the next one, this one's do not produce an action potential. So the message is, only synchronously activated calcium releases in yet even temporal and spatially synchronized are able to produce 
alterations in the action in the memory potential that produce action potentials. Otherwise, they are silent. They are they remain alterations within the cell. So, but this is this happened during adrenergic stimulation, but it doesn't happen to all of us. I mean, this is actually from a cell with a mutation in the Ryanodin receptor that makes it more sensitive to triggering events. Okay, so this is from a um, an, uh, CPVT mouse, a mouse that has a mutation in the Ryanodin receptor that produces CPVT in humans. Okay, and I'm gonna explain what is CPVT. So you probably know about it. Uh, Reticulaminergic or morphic ventricular tachycardia is an autosomally dominant inherited cardiac disease characterized by exercise or stress-induced tachyarrhythmias only during emotional stress or, or physical stress. Uh, in the absence of uh, a structural heart disease or prolonged QT interval, that's the clinical definition. So, so it happens only during sympathetic stimulation. Uh, the disease is highly malignant, uh, often manifesting for the first time in childhood and adolescence through syncopal events, and, or it could be the first sign could be sudden death. Sudden coming arrest. And then uh, you don't have to be an electrophysiologist in order to understand that this is a, an abnormal ECG. Uh, so, this is a, a girl that has a CTVT mutation and is subject to a, an exercise test. 0.5 minutes after that, you still start to see this um, pre premature ventricular complex, and then it turns into this so called bidirectional ventricular tachycardia. This, uh, when the axis of the polarization goes one way, and then another way, one way, the other way, one way, the other way. So bidirectional ventricular tachycardia, which is characterized, uh, is pathognomonic of calcium-dependent arrhythmias, because you can you can do that, that type of alteration with digitalis intoxication, for instance, which increases sodium in the cell, and calcium also, and it produces, it produces the, uh, the, uh, this type of, uh, of, of arrhythmias. Okay, so that's that's CPVT. It's it's a very uh, very classical example of calcium dependent arrhythmias, and in, 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 in how the Ryan receptor, for instance, can create this this these aberrations in in in, in lethal arrhythmias. The mutations uh, have been mapped already to to several sites in the Ryan receptor to a specific domains of the Ryan receptor. Uh, this is an old. 2007, but uh, right now there are about 160 mutations already discovered, um, and they all fall, most of them anyway, um, only 8% do not, uh, they all fall in three regions of the, of the protein. The N-terminal, the central domain, and the carboxyl N. And the distribution of those mutations is very similar to what happens in another syndrome of the Ryanodin receptor, which is called malignant hyperthermia. So in malignant hypertension, there's also mutations that occur in those sites. So those sites gotta be hot. So so you don't touch them because they are very sensitive to perturbations. Um, in malignant hypertension, you know we have also uncontrolled calcium release in a system that is closer for calcium exit. So calcium gets trapped into the skeletal muscle, and then the pump starts to the calcium pump in the SR starts to try to recapture it, and it breaks a lot of ATP creating the loss of energy that is transformed into heat. That's the malignant hyperthermia syndrome. In the heart, we have extrusion mechanisms that instead of trapping the calcium, depletes calcium from the, uh, from, from the cell, and that but it is arrhythmogenic because of the cell calcium exchange that is involved. So it's the same type of syndrome, uh, but in two different systems. <coughs> These are the mutations. With they fall mostly in places where there is interaction of two subunits. So if you remember the answer is a tetramer, four homologous, homologous subunits, and they are interacting to close the channel to make it uh, tightly closed, and, and most of them occur in, in certain sites of interaction of, of those subunits. Okay. Now the way um, we have approached this, uh, this, uh, this um, problem, uh, how, what are the molecular mechanisms that cause arrhythmia in, in due to mutations, is by having animal models that uh, have uh, mutations in each of those domains. Um, we have um, a mouse uh, with this mutation. This is a gift actually from Susan Hamilton, 
we have generated these other four, uh, four mice. Um, and so um, what we look is uh, we, we take the, the mice and, and then uh, subject them to, to uh, adrenergic stimulation and see the incidence of arrhythmias, what type of arrhythmias uh, are um, um, unelicited, what type of treatment is more effective, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, in most cases, this is what we see. So this is, uh, again, a normal um, wild-type ventricular mice site from one of those mice. Uh, so it's completely normal to see an action potential, plasma transient. This is what you would expect to see in a good day of cell isolation, no ischemia during perfusion and all that. <laughs> and if you have now uh, a little mate with the mutation, then for instance in this case, it's a, it's a loss of function mutation that results also in the same mechanism, which is a very high load of calcium in the SR. And when that happens, here we're loading the cell with calcium and then it gets to a point in which the calcium <coughs> is, is high enough that the receptor just vomit the calcium in, in, the, in, in, the, in the cytosol, producing, producing this, this prolonged calcium wave that is translated in an elongation of the duration of the action position that is even gets in, into the next uh, in the, to the next uh, uh, stimulation. So, yeah, and, and and you saw in the other example DADs. In this case, we're looking at EADs mostly uh, as as a way of explicit uh, arrhythmia. But in most cases, in most cases, this is the simplified way in which we can explain arrhythmias in CPVT. If we imagine that this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, then your invasive condition is loaded to a certain level. And the threshold for a spontaneous calcium release is way above that level. That's why it's very difficult to see spontaneous calcium release and basal conditions in a wild type cell. All right? So it, because there's there's no enough calcium to stimulate that that way end of the receptor. During sympathetic stimulation, the level of calcium increases because of the mechanism I explained, but it's still below the threshold for a spontaneous calcium release. So in a normal, in a wild type cell, spontaneous calcium release is, is rare. In the CPVT mutant channel, now because of the mutation, the channel is now more sensitive for activation. So the threshold for a spontaneous calcium release is lower than in the one type. And during sympathetic stimulation, it gets above that, and the incidence of the calcium spillover is higher because of, because of the extra load of calcium, that, that is, which is a power of the stimulation for, for opening so right So that's, analogically, it could be like, we have a dam, uh, which is the, the, the gates of the right receptor that are holding the water, and then some mutation perturbs that, those gates, and then calcium comes rushing out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it gets little houses in between, and it drags them all with, with the current. So that's, that's, that's the sudden cardiac arrest that, that we see through CPVT. And, and there are eff the efforts to, to, uh, to seal the, the, um, um, the the dam to seal the the, the blood to seal the 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 sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, the, so that it doesn't spill the calcium. The most uh, used one in, in, in the first line of therapy for CPVT is beta blockers because they block the beta adrenergic beta adrenergic response via at its root. But there's also flecainide now being used uh, because it decreases or it increases the threshold for activation of sodium channels by, by the sodium calcium exchanger. And it's supposed to have also a blocking effect on Ryan receptors, although this is more debated. Carbedilol, it's, a, it's also a beta blocker that it has been demonstrated to have effects on Ryan receptors to, to, to block Ryan receptors uh, and also blocking beta adrenergic receptors. KN93 is specific for kinase 2 which is very arrhythmogenic uh, soft uh, enzyme. And H89 is exclusive for, uh, for big PKA. So like, like, like I said before, these are all therapies designed to, 
to block the activity of my own self, to block that, to seal the compartment and not avoid the spill of calcium. But there are other sources, and there are other ways of doing that, uh, we believe. And um, venomous, uh, poisonous animals have traditionally been sources of, of drugs and targets. For instance, exenatide, it's from the Gila monster, uh, that it's, it's, it's an it's a, uh, effective therapy for diabetic uh, uh, people. Captopril is the is is poster child of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of poisonous animal producing beneficial drugs. Captopril is this peptide here. I mean, actually, this is, this is the, the mother peptide. This is the parent uh, molecule. It is, it, has, uh, it is in the venom of a snake, uh, uh, in a snake of the uh, Amazons. Uh, and people there use small amounts of venom uh, into people to do stuff to you know it's part of their of their arsenal of drugs that they have there. Uh, but the the uh, this peptide on its ending has a side. I mean has amino acids that fit exactly on the pocket of the angiotensin converting enzyme, and they in it, it, it they fit in the pocket of that enzyme with with picomolar affinity. It's uh, the interaction is is it's it's a very strong, it's almost covalent interaction. So what, what uh, the developers of Capricorn did was to, to shave all this part that has nothing to do with the interaction with the, uh, with the uh, angiotensin converter enzyme and produce first this succinyl probe and then Captopril, which is a very simple molecule. It's, it's actually a one amino acid with, with modification in the end. And so this is bioactive it's orally active, and uh, as we know, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's uh, an effective uh, an effective um, bas basal dilator because it blocks uh, the conversion of angiotensin to its active form, and it's for it's been it's been a major drug for Abbott. Abbott has raised uh, about seven billion dollars uh, uh, out of profits for, from 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 this drug at all. So it's like I said, it's poster child. Everyone wants to have a captopril in his in his in his development project. So we have experience with this poisonous animal, which is not so poisonous. It's uh, it's called Pandinus imperator. And look at how big it is in comparison with, with this uh, with the hands of this guy. Now, um, <laughs> imperator because it's so big that it's about the biggest in the scorpion uh, genre. But uh, in fact, this is, he's not so, 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 uh, there's some, uh, he's not so valiant. What happens is that these scorpions actually don't, are not poisonous to mammals. They don't have the potassium and sodium channel blocking toxins. So they have another, another type of toxin. So that's why this the, the thing produces pain, but not, it's not systemic, there are no systemic effects. Okay, so out of this the scorpion comes this peptide. It's a 33 amino acid peptide, very basic. Uh, you can see by the uh, blue dots here that those are supposed to represent uh, basic uh, residues, positively charged, and uh, very compact due to its uh, scaffold here. Two, three diesel bridges that hold it together, very globular. Um, and so this imperacalcin uh, gave rise to a f whole family of scorpion peptides that have been discovered over the over the years. Morocalcin is another one which is also very highly studied. Uh, um, they have segregation of charges, that's why they create a type 4 moment. And so far there are eight of these peptides in several venoms. You know, um, most of the uh, most of them are from the general cactina. Um, so these peptides very similar in the structure, but they have differences in amino acid sequence, obviously, and due to those differences, they have different affinity for the ryanodine receptor. This is activation curves of ryanodine, ryanodine receptors, uh, by the various peptides. So the, the, sequ the sequence uh, difference accounts for affinities from 300 picomolar, this one, 
to 300 nanomoles, 330 nanomoles. So three orders of magnitude uh, just by varying uh, some amino acids in the active sites of those peptides. So it's the way they engage the ion circle to different affinities. So what do they do? So these peptides are very special in this sense. So, so this is the Rayano receptor gating from close to open in a very compressed way. This is a uh, compressed time. You don't see the individual uh, openings, but this is what imperacalcin does, for instance. Imperacalcin, a 15 nanomolar, is very different. So it induces a self-conducting state, and then it lets go of the channel, and you see normal gating, self-conducting state, normal gating, self-conducting Right? So it's, and the same for monocalcium, for instance. Uh, the difference between them is the subconducting state level. 34% here, 48% here, but the same reversible modding mode. So they, they are agonists. They are agonists of Ryan and because they open, they stabilize the subconducting states of long duration. In this one right here. And so the flow of calcium through that modified channel is, low, is, is higher than, than in the open, than in the closed state, obviously, because it's, it's a, even though it's subconducting, it's still calcium flowing. So that's why they are agonist of Rayanus. But the other, the other thing that I'm going to show in the other one is that, uh, uh, is that they, op they only bind when the channel is open. They have to wait for the channel to open in order for them to bind. They are basic. And we thought that they would not cross membranes, but they belong to the to the genre of cell penetrating peptides, which were discovered about 25 years ago with with that protein from the HIV virus. Um, so here is the peptide. Here's the imperacalcin. We attach covalently uh, a ionophore, in this case Alexa 543, which is in the salt form. It's positively charged. And so we uh, uh, and we put that into uh, in, uh, we incubate cells and here 15 minutes you start to see fluorescence in the interior cell. At 30 minutes there's complete penetration of, of the of the fluorophore into the into the cell, indicating that the the uh, the, um, the toxin the the peptide crosses membrane without actually damaging the structure of the heart and, and the structure of the cell. We will see that. We will see how. This is the acute effect of, of, of putting uh, imperacalcin in, in on inter uh, myocytes. So we have here a uh, uh, beating in, in ventricular cell, uh, field stimulated, and then at this point we uh, apply imperacalcin, uh, about, five, about 500, 0.5 micromolar. And you see, this is one second, two seconds, about three seconds after application of imperacalcin, we see an effect an increase in the amplitude of the calcium transient. And then, that's, that's the first effect. And then, the steady state, steady state amplitude is lower than before, than before the application of the, of, of the, of the intercalcium. But still, the cell beats, and, and we can know, and we know that there's still calcium inside the SR, because if we apply caffeine, then we got to empty completely the 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 the, uh, the the calcium store, so it takes about three seconds for penetration, and it's not as effective as caffeine. You know, obviously, we we're putting here only 0.5 micromolar of intercalcium versus 10 millimolar versus 10 millimolar uh, caffeine. So there's of course there's a huge difference in, in quantity, right? But so so the effect is is, is very rapid. In the other slide, I show you the defect took about 15 minutes, but that's because it has cargo attached to it. So it has, it, that slug, that makes the, the penetration slower. But when it's intact, it, it's, a lot, it's a lot faster. All right, so, so we have, a, so this peptide penetrates membranes and it, it induces this type of, this type of, 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 uh, of uh, partial depletion of the sarcoplan reticulum. So if it doesn't kill you, it, it can make you stronger. Yeah. Mm. So if I if I see it clearly, uh, so in the in the in the uh, mouse size, uh, there is uh, inside of the mice size a mouse stain. 
Oh, yeah, no, yeah. they are. Oh, you mean in the other? In the yeah, yeah, in the previous slide, yeah. yeah so, no, they are. Are the, so, so <coughs> these parts, the, the toxin doesn't go in there, or is that? No, it does go in there. It's still going in. What compartment is that? That, this that is, is not a stain. This is the cytosol. Oh, this one that is not, it is, is the nucleus. Nucleus, it yeah, doesn't go into the nucleus. nucleus. Yeah, the nucleus. So this, this thing actually recognizes the the memory, different memory. It, it could be, it could be, yeah. It, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, easier, it's easier to penetrate the external membrane than the nuclear membrane, I don't know why. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's, that is the, uh, the, the acute effect. So, what, what, uh, the idea here is that if it empties partially the sacroplan reticulum, maybe this could be something that helps in the initial event that causes arrhythmia in CPVT mutations. So if it, instead of bursting the dam, you know, instead of trying to seal the dam, why not relieving the pressure in a very subdued way, let's call it controlled way. So to empty the SR to a level in which it doesn't stimulate the mutant receptors. So that was the idea that I proposed one of my students to test. You know, is it, is it going to work or not? Um, and the animal that we use is, a, is an animal that has a mutation in the RAN receptor uh, that produces CPVT. It's very reliable in terms of, of the um, producing arrhythmia under an arrhythmogenic cocktail, right? So uh, we use uh, anesthetized mice, then we do an intraperitoneal injection of two milligrams of caffeine, of, of two milligrams per kilogram of epinephrine, that's the beta energy stimulation, and 120 milligrams per kilogram of caffeine. We have to put caffeine to make the channel to make the channel more arrhythmogenic. Uh, under anesthesia, the cardiovascular system gets depressed, and 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 so uh, we need an extra stimulator rather than other than uh, better than natural stimulation. So, caffeine sensitizes my receptors to uh, to calcium, and that causes the the the, the arrhythmia uh, in these mice, but. Uh, but we've done this against a wild type, obviously, and the incidence is much higher in the, in the mice having the mutation, otherwise it would not be a good control. Did they have arrhythmias with exercise? Yes, yes, but we have to have them conscious, and, and we do have already experiments with conscious animals. I'm going to talk about uh, them in the, uh, in the large, large part of my talk. Yes. Okay, so, so initially we just monitored, um, so this is based on ECGs before any manipulation, just an exercise of mice. And then we inject the cocktail that I told you, caffeine and epinephrine. <coughs> and then start to see PVCs. And then it doesn't take much, one minute, two minutes, we start to see the bidirectional ventricular tachycardia. This is the most the most representative example of arrhythmias <coughs> due to CPVT mutation, the, the, the bidirectional ventricular tachycardia. So that's in that can, lo can last for long. So that's that's that is the protocol. So we have this mice that we can reliably induce arrhythmias under this protocol. What what is the effect of impercalcium? Will it exacerbate or will it mitigate those arrhythmias? That's that's what we are going to test next. So this is again baseline. And then we have to add impercalcium before, number one, to prime the, uh, the, the heart with impercalcium, and number two, to see what the effect of impercalcium alone. And there's no electrical alterations due to impercalcium injection. No electrical alterations. So that's, that's a good start then. And then we start with the with the cocktail, epinephrine plus caffeine in that impercalcium loaded heart or mice, mouse. And then we see PCs. PCs don't go all the way, don't we have but well, we have mostly a clean ECG. We have PDCs now and then, but there's no bidirectional ventricular tachycardia in most of these uh, mice. See? So in the end, we, we have scores for arrhythmia, you know, uh, duration, um, and, and whether the, um, uh, count the number of PVCs, count the number of, uh, of, uh, of there's a score for bidirectional ventricular tachycardia, and in doing that, the, the symptom score is much lower under 
in, in paracalcium injection than in the control. So it is an attenuator of arrhythmia. This agonist of Rayano the receptor attenuates arrhythmia, mitigates arrhythmia. It doesn't prevent them all, but it does mitigate them uh, in a very, in a very, in a very uh, uh, significant way. So along, along these lines of thought, so you know the other the other variety of uh, CPVT is called sequestering mutations, and I wonder if it's possible to have a kind of sequestering mutation that would do the same thing. And is, is there any clinical naturally okay occurring? Double mutations in our amyloid receptor and for sequestering. And are these patients less or more um, malignant than the ones that have the single mutation? Do you know anything about that? I, I don't know. Because it's similar. It's a similar principle. Right. Right. The mutations in the amyloid receptor are dominant. It means just one allele is sufficient to do the to do the uh, to cause the, the syndrome. Uh, the mutations in calcium are recessive. So right. you have to have more, both at least mutated uh, to have. But, uh, but uh, I don't know of any patient yet, or any case in which I, I never double, heard double, double mutation. I know it must be a nice, uh, you know, instead correct. of dealing with their androgen receptor, which is already mutated and all of that, one possibility is to go and impose some mutations of the question, and that's yeah. Yeah. precisely controlled. Right. Well, the question of cow's mouse is very very much Yeah. yeah. That's a lot. Okay, so that's that's the maybe maybe scorpions are good for our health. We never knew about that. About that. Uh, the Chinese knew about it, and, and they have it as a delicacy. Uh, so, if you have so for us, the facts were that uh, I mean, very strong data. It's uh, it's the prevention of arrhythmia versus the exacerbation of arrhythmia. So as, as Mark Twain puts it, get your facts first, then you can distort them as you please. And in this case, we want to know how to distort this, this fact, um, how to explain it. And in, 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 in if we compare two, two examples that look the same, but they produce very, very different microscopic uh, effects. Let's compare the effect of imperacalcin versus rhyanolin. This is where insecticides come into place in the title. Ryanolin was used as an insecticide until a few years ago, when it was discontinued due to, uh, due to the toxicity that in, it induces in, in mammals. You know, the, it was spread over uh, tropical plants, and and and, and, and then uh, it, it's too toxic for, for to be used as an insecticide. DDT is also very toxic, but but still. <laughs> anyway, so um, interacalcin induces this effect, as I showed you before. So conducting a state. And then reversible in the sense that you see the channel free of calcium, and then with calcium, free of calcium, with calcium, and so on. Ryanodine, on the other hand, it has it, it is this property that is called recalcitrant to dissociation. Once it binds, it doesn't let go of the channel for four or five seconds. Seconds. Whereas compared with this, uh, a few milliseconds, so say 100 milliseconds, what? 150 milliseconds, as it will time. In the case of Ryanolin, you have long, long, long periods of time in which you have modified receptors. This is so conducting the state, and so is this. So the way we approach this uh, uh, to, to see how the modus operandi of these two ligands is through a rapid injection, rapid exchange, uh, rapid solution exchange system in which we have the channel incorporated in bilayers, and then we approach uh, a syringe that is loaded with agonists, ryanolin, paracalcin, calcium, carmogenin, about 50 microns away from the channel. And so in one, in about 14 milliseconds, we exchange the whole solution in front of the channel. Uh, that's about the artifact of injection, how it lasts, 14 milliseconds. Uh, and so we see the kinetics of the channel responding to the agonist, <coughs> okay? So this is what we see. If, we, if the calcium concentration is low, then the PO of the channel is low. 0.02 in this case. You see brief openings here. This is the artifact of injection. So we inject imperacalcin here. And then channel opens, but there's no, no modification. Channel open again, no modification. Channel open here, and then the, the, the calcium valve and produce that superconducting state. So
So the latency is long. For this one, the PO is higher, it opens here, and then it modifies right away. So the latency is shorter. For channels with high PO, then you get out of the artifact of injection, is the channel is already modified. In 14 milliseconds, it's already modified. Okay. For ryanodine, the association is, is, is slower. So here, uh, channel open. There's a gap of about two, five seconds here. We don't have the length. But then once it binds, it will go about, about that way in terms of uh, the, the, long, the length of, uh, of modification. So it is very long, long uh, subconducting step. Um, and here, again, we decrease the latency by increasing the OPO. So when you plot that, you get the higher the PO, the shorter the latency. It's indicating that the channel must open in order for the, for the ligands to bind to the open channel. And once they bound, well, once they are bind, once they bind, then the resonance time, the dwelling time, is independent of the PO because the, the ligand does not remember how long the channel was open before it bound to it. So, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a uniform uh, reaction that is entirely dependent, that is entirely dependent on the, on the uh, intrinsic uh, affinity between the, the amino acids and the ligand. That's something weird though. I mean, that, yeah. that looks like a Gaussian distribution of dwell time. Which one? This one? Well, no, on the right. But the dwell time should be an exponential distribution if it's if it's an off rate it's of, of impericalcin or... Right, well, I, I, with these few openings, with these few openings, I don't know if you can do a Gaussian distribution. Uh, they are, in fact, if we do, if we, if we do um, dwell time in over thousands, then we then we see we see an exponential decay uh, with one one particular one particular uh, uh, off rate. Yeah, but uh, I mean, here are 20 or, or uh, I don't know, uh, 25. So there's really no and not, not enough data to, in order to make a, a caution or, or exponential fits. But I mean, if it was a Gaussian, that would violate uh, right. normal dissociation of anything chemically because it should be an exponential distribution. So. But do you think it's a Gaussian? With, with, no, with that point? What, what, is, what it looks like. It's hard to do. Yeah. It, what it says is there's a characteristic dwell time. With what? Dwell time. You yes. have a dwell time of 200 milliseconds for impericalcium and 4,000 for ryanodine. Correct. Which, if it was a, a normal chemical dissociation, it, it cannot look like that. So it, it means there's something characteristic. It's keeping a constant time, which means something very different. Uh -huh. I, I don't know I, what to make of it. I don't know either. <laughs> this is the data. So the way I interpret, I interpret this is that is that a, is that a, um, once the ligand binds to the channel, um, there is an intrinsic uh, rate of dissociation that is spread over this time range from about 80 to 200 milliseconds in the case of beracalcin, and in the case of of, of Rayanum, it's spread over. 2,000 and what 3,000 milliseconds to 5,000 milliseconds. Uh, that's that's how long. I mean, if those were estimated <coughs> mean latency times from individual patches, maybe that's okay. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Why axis is the PO? Why axis is this is not the this is not the uh, the, the history. Why axis is PO of, of the channel? Right? This one. Yeah. 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 But x axis is is dwell time. He's got in, what, is each individual point from one patch or from one opening? From one opening, from okay, one duration. One yeah, yeah, from one, yeah, from one event. That's why it's hard to, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I don't know what it means physically. It's just, it's fascinating. Okay. So if the channel, if the ligands bind to the open channel only, <laughs> what is the opportunity they have to manipulate, the acti to modulate the activity of, of channels in an intercell. So this is the calcium transient. Uh, the calcium transient is actually the, ad the addition of many fluxes uh, uh, going on at the same time. What is drawn here is the, the calculated SR calcium flux. Okay, so in fact, so 
in order to create this transient, you have to channels opening, Ryan status opening, and then it's spontaneously closing to 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 have this 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 calcium profile. And the time constant depends on the species, obviously. Uh, some are faster than others. And this is for rabbit cells. 27 milliseconds uh, is the time constant for for uh, closing, a spontaneous closing of the Ryan receptors, which uh, have. There are many theories about how it exactly happens and uh, this closure of Ryan receptors. But uh, but that's the point. This is the only time in which imperacalcin or Ryanodin are able to modify the activity of those channels. Okay, and in once modified, what is what is the effect that, that they want to produce? Okay, so these are the cellular effects. Um, calcium imaging on top, and this is the profile of calcium transients as, as they are drawn from the from the images above. So the, in control, we have we have stimulation of once per second. We can stimulate that cell for long, long periods of time, and then empty calcium at the end with caffeine to measure the load of calcium BSR. That's what we're doing here. If we do that with cells pre-incubated with imperacalcin, then we see first the transient is lower, I mean the amplitude is lower, and then there's a small but significant elevation of the diastolic of the resting calcium. Okay? So shorter transients and a little elevation of the diastolic calcium. And the load is lower at the end. Okay, the SR load is lower. Then we have caffeine. I mean sorry. Ryanodin. If we pre incubate cells with Ryanodin, then we see very dwarf uh, transients. And it's mo most of this is probably calcium entry and exit through the entire calcium channel. So the SR is already inactivated. As we see the empty of the SR, it puts only this little bump here. So there's very little load of calcium in the SR. So very different effects due to equivalent additions of ligands of triangular receptors. Completely different. One is toxic and the other is not. It's, it may be, but it's not uh, dependent, uh, based on this. So this is an amplification of those places. Uh, this, the the uh, black is the uh, the control, and then the red is the uh, uh, imperacalcin modified. You see the resting level, the calcium is higher, the amplitude lower, and the calcium, the the uh, the rayanoline modified transit is completely different from that. These are the numbers for those observations that I showed you. So, so the cells continue to beat, uh, like like I said at the, at the beginning, and they continue to, to they don't they don't get intoxicated like like with rayanoline. The hearts, it's something kind of similar. So we have here ligand or perfused hearts. At this point in time, right there, we apply one micromolar rayanity, continue perfusing rayanity. You see, look at the, uh, uh, this is left ventricular pressure. There's a little balloon reporting pressure. Left ventricular, uh, the systolic pressure falls, the diastolic pressure increases, and then we have now, for all purposes, an intoxicated heart in the sense that it doesn't beat now. Now, with imperacalcin, this is also one micromolar addition at this point. Initially, there is an increase in the amplitude of the transient, of the uh, systolic pressure, I'm sorry, and then it falls again to a steady level that is sustainable for a long period of time. So, we interpret this as, as the first, as the first uh, increase in the amplitude of the calcium transient that we saw in the cells. And then the partial depletion of calcium from this are produces a lower steady, steady, uh, steady uh, um, systolic, pr uh, systolic pressure. We don't see much of an elevation of the diastolic uh, pressure uh, as we saw in the cells. So these are the uh, the numbers of that. The heart rate also uh, does not get modified substantially by imperacalcin, but it does get modified by by Ryan. All right, so. Can yeah. you see the same effect if you just lower ryanodine concentration, or, or are there we'll any lower ryanodine concentration? Yeah, ten nanomoles. Uh -huh. Or are there any uh, lower affinity ryanodine analogs? Right, which is the same. Which is ryanodol, for instance. Ryanodol is a, is is it also produces a subconducting state with uh, with uh, with um, so uh, with reversible effects. Uh, it's reversible in the sense that it's long, short, at dwell time. And 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 um, and uh, but but uh, the effective dose of Ryanol is in the tens of micromolar uh, 
compared to the to the tensor microcontroller at the single channel level. In, in, in whole hearts, it could take 100 microcontroller, I don't know how much it, it, ha it would have to take in order to do those experiments. So we haven't done it because at that point, uh, Ryan will start to block L type calcium channels too. But just so lowering Ryan then, can that do anything like in pericalcium? We haven't done a, a complete dose response, uh, so we don't know. We don't know uh, call it. Question? Yeah. Uh, so do you worry about that the, that the transient increase of calcium? Uh, worry in the sense of what? Worry. Uh, uh, well, I, mean, I actually, I actually, I actually like it because I, it's, it's telling me that in is doing something. Otherwise, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, no yes, right. it's, so yes, it's the uh, arrhythmogenic uh, oh, for, okay, for that okay. period of time. Right. Um, actually, uh, there's no arrhythmias reported by impercalcin. We saw that in the electrocalcin. It's a better, it was a better place to, to look at that. Impercalcin alone does not produce arrhythmias. So, so there's no electrical disturbances. Most of the effects are to are in the inotropy of the of the heart, uh, in the strength of the heart, but not in the electricity. Okay, so um, the control. So the, the the effect of the effect of impercalcin is we interpret it to be mainly due to its partial unloading of the SR calcium. And, and we have here the effect in this is a concrete measure of how much. The load of calcium gives up changes with impercalcin. It depletes, in this case, in one microvolt in paracalcium, about 40% uh, uh, of the of the content of calcium gives up. So we have the effect increasing the in the transient and then a decrease in the amplitude due to the unloading of calcium from this heart. And the uh, the prevention of arrhythmias, we believe, is due to this effect. So we have here a CTVT cardiomyocyte. Under control conditions, we, we load the cell with, with uh, calcium by stimulating here a train of stimuli, and then let the cell rest to see if there's a spontaneous calcium release. And then measure calcium load by putting caffeine. If we do the same with imperacalcin, we load the cell, but the amplitude is decreased, but there's no spontaneous calcium release. There's actually a more uniform leak of calcium from the entire so that's why we see this bump here. And the load and the load is lower at the end. Now, if the same cells are stimulated with isopotenol, then there's more calcium entry into the SR, and then there's a spontaneous calcium release. So this is what determines the DADs that I show you at the beginning. And that's the load. So the load increases obviously with isopotenol. With impericalcine, like I said, more uniform leak of calcium. So it, it's, it's, not, it's not preventing calcium leak. It is actually increasing calcium leak, but in a very uniform way, in a way, in, a, in, a, in, a, in such a manner that the discrete packets of calcium release that stimulate the calcium exchanger are now not present. And then you have, you have more, a more silent leak that is not reflected electrically. And those are the numbers. If you do a similar protocol now with CPVT bathed, uh, CPVT cells bathing with calcium externally, then those ca that calcium is going to permeate into the cell, and it is going to produce a spontaneous calcium release. And that's what is shown here. With calcium, it takes a lot more, lot more calcium, and you start to see so, so the incidence of those spontaneous calcium releases decreases a lot with calcium. And most likely, more more uh, illustrative here is if we uh, expose a particular myocyte that's naked, uh, I mean chemically permeabilized uh, cell, and then we uh, put 100 more calcium surrounding the cell, so the calcium it starts to get trapped into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then it starts to get cycled back by the by the pump, expel, trap, expel, trap, and that producing those waves. And that's that's uh, with impercalcin. So there's a, there's a partial depletion, but again, it's a uniform depletion. Saponin. Saponin. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just to make the uh, so obviously the waves are gone. And this is just just to close. Now this is the example that I showed you at the beginning. The same same uh, same cell. 
before interacousin. So we stimulated cell with 101 interacousin. I mean, yeah, isoprotenol, and we saw the spontaneous calcium release, okay? The ones that I, it's exactly the same example that I showed you at the beginning. Bathe that cell with 100 nanomolar in paracalcium now. And there's more, the transient is decreasing amplitude, but there's, and there's, there's, you can see an elevation of the, of the, of the calcium because of the fluorescence increases in between, in between the stimulations, but there's no discrete packets of a spontaneous calcium release that originated the action potential, the, the external action potential. Does this affect uh, frequency dependence? I would assume if you face right. faster or slower, it can change. Maybe. Right. Yeah, I, we it's haven't tried that. Or, or I would expect. The calcium cycling story would change. Correct. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting to look at it in the whole physiological range. Yeah. Because with the, with the isopaternal, there's always also increasing heart rate. Right, and, and and we have data also in, in intact animals, and in, in, in it, it prevents everything. Okay, so I'm gonna somebody before you guys go for for trick or treating. Calcium is a family of small membrane permeable scorpion mice that target Ryan receptors with high affinity and selectivity. They capture Ryan receptors open and induce a self-conducting state, but unlike Ryanodine. Calcins readily dissociate from the binding site, allowing for recovery of Ryan receptor for the next contraction cycle. So calcin prevents, not exacerbates, CPVT episodes. So this is an, an agonist that prevents uh, arrhythmias. The proposed mechanism of action is as follows. Um, by acting within a limited time window, calcin gently unloads the SR of calcium. And this partial and controlled depletion of ESR avoids spontaneous calcium release events of critical mass to produce BADs and trigger activity. That's our that's our, our hypothesis. That's how we explain it. Thank you for uh, a wonderful story. I, I have one quick question. So yeah. just in relation to arrhythmogenesis. Yeah. So when you started, I think the premise is that what is arrhythmogenic and what is the threshold for inducing arrhythmias is the production of triggered action potentials. Okay. And things that are producing sub-threshold delayed after depolarization can be tolerated. Right. Ah. You know, the arrhythmias occur in the whole heart or in the multicellular tissue, not in single cells. Yeah. And in, in, in multicellular tissue and in the heart in particular, not of the mouse, but of you know, species, mammals that have long plateau and so on. Those releases that are sub-threshold for Maybe. causing DADs can change the action potential morphology, can induce all kinds of dispersions of repolarization and very arrhythmogenic substrate. Yeah. So, so, so that's another way to think about arrhythmogenicity. It's mm -hmm. more complex in, in multicellular tissue. Right than just producing a trigger action potential in a single mm -hmm. cell. Right. That, that's my... Right. Well, that's, yeah, that's... Because usually you need, you know, you need substrate and you need trigger. Correct. You showed how you can get triggers, but you know, the substrate could be also a function of the calcium cycle. It doesn't have to reach stretch. Right. Yeah. With, with, with all the, with all the uh, limitations that a model like a mouse uh, has for, for we're leading this into, into how the human heart uh, works and how this stroke can be applicable to human hearts. But, uh, but uh, this is what I said at the beginning. Um, the, I can, we can interpret this in many ways and that's what, get your facts first and then you can distort them as you please. But for me, it's very important to see the microscopic effect as being as, uh, I mean, I, ha I, I put a lot of weight into the prevention of arrhythmias. So for, it's happening somehow, right? And, and I, this, I understand. This is my All I'm saying is that mm -hmm. yeah. maybe your criterion is very strong. It's it's a okay. criterion for generation trigger generation of triggers that are triggered activity up. I'm saying even below threshold okay. changes okay. in the long action potential depends on a very delicate balance of currents. Okay. Well, small changes in the calcium transit that can be caused by this may not cause a triggered action potential, but can change the action potential morphology 
in a very arrhythmogenic way. Um, have you looked at studies with uh, impera calcium where you don't have calcium binding proteins like buffers in the myoplasm to, to look at um, buffers in the myoplasma? Ma without buffers in the myoplasm, have you looked at impera calcium studies? No, no, you mean buffers of calcium in the myoplasm? Yes. No, we haven't done that. So, but, yeah, I would like to know. So, what's, what's in your mind? Um, no. I mean, because w what you're showing is you're showing that empiricalcin actually depletes the SR. Partially depletes. Partially depletes yeah, yeah. the SR. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I'm kind of curious to see how much of the calcium that's extruded from the SR is actually, uh, you know, the free buffers are actually right. taking it up. So it's not okay. a true estimate of. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I don't know about, that, but we see an increase in in, in fluorescence. Of uh, uh, we can see an increase of calcium in the in the whole cytosol uh, after application of of, of calcium. So so there's there's an elevation of diastolic calcium, and and we assume that the initial uh, the partial depletion that it had was extruded from the from the from the cell by the stomach calcium changes, but in a in a let's say in a metered way, so that it could be tolerated by by this exchange. Yeah. So is that is that toxin was it easy to synthesize or is it yeah. hard to get those three types of it's, it's it's easy to synthesize. So the linear peptide you can get grams of it. <laughs> the active form is a little more tricky because there are three disulfide bridges and you have to have the right concentration of DTT and I mean, DTT and oxidized glutathione and oxidized reduced glutathione. Go through cycles of oxidation and reduction and then and then hope that it's actually the most uh, conformationally stable form, and then just purify the cyclic active form. So that's a little more tricky, um, but uh, but it's done. I mean, we can we we done for all the eight calcins uh, to date. So so it's doable. You just manually change the solutions to do to do that. We we play with the concentration of GSP and uh, and oxidize and reduce glutathione in one step. In uh, you know in several steps in several steps yeah so yeah just and by random DTT right well yeah so, yeah so and you you get when you purify this you get with a big shoulder uh, with a big um, in the in the HPLC yeah. you look at several peaks yeah. so so you have assay for activity in each of those because the incorrectly folded are not active okay. or the linears are yeah. not active so get. Say I don't know, 80, 70 percent of those are correctly folded. Mm -hmm. the, the, the yeah. Uh, yeah. So to come back to this point about the uh, uh, the Gaussian distribution. No, uh, <laughs> I give up. On that. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that over dinner. But the, the point about the uh, low concentration of ryanidine. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. If, if you, you could, there, there would be a point at which you could go lower the ryanidine concentration so that the uh, relative Duty cycle is the same. It's just that it would be a slower on time because it would be a lower concentration, and a longer and a slower off time right. because it's more potent when it binds more strongly. Yeah. But I'm wondering if that, in and of itself, would be anything. Would would it still result in the same result? In other words, that the real on and off times are they in that? Is it kinetically important that that the uh, empiric calcium? Yeah. Is, is a faster off rate, right. or is it simply that you're looking in a range where it's effectively only 50 percent? Right. Well, the, well the, yeah. I, I would I would like to to give this data to modelers to see what how how they can interpret it. But the way I see it is, uh, so once w I'm once about experiment, so do it experimentally. Yeah. Go on. Once 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 ryanolin traps one ryanolin receptor then it gets it off the duty cycle for several, several uh, seconds. seconds, yes, several seconds. So, so, so if you get, even though it's a slow, slow association, you will get progressive recruitment okay. of channels that will go off the duty cycle. Okay, but the arrhythmogenic source within the cell is the macroscopic end result. It doesn't matter that one, it, it, that you see what, what you've got is effectively, or maybe it doesn't matter, that what you've got at any one point in time is 
50% of the ryanidine receptors active and 50% not in the presence of ryanidine, versus within pericalcin, it's, you've got 100% that are 50% on and off during the calcium cycle. Right. And I, I'm just, so yeah, you could play with it modeling-wise to see what's going on, but okay. the, yeah. the, the, the proof of the pudding is in, in experimentally experiment. eating it. Right. So I'm just curious, if right. you lowered the ryanidine, could you get a ryanidine concentration where you see the same, the same effect as that one? Yeah. That's, that's the question. Could it, could it be that when you stabilize in subconductance, you're saying then you're gaining function? Yeah. But you could also lose function. Because uh -huh. if you stabilize, right, if you stabilize subconductance on the, on the expense of the higher conductance, the higher, or the whole conductance. You might be losing function. Correct. Correct. So it's another tricky business. It might, yes. might be also a, a, a rate dependent. It seems to me it can go either way. We can argue about where the proof is. <laughs> Over pudding. <laughs> Which pudding? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.